hello welcome to a session on uh, mary wollstone craft and her work a uh, vindication for the rights of women so this was published in 1972 and i will uh, quite soon discuss some of the major arguments by wollstone craft and this book is contested as one of the foundational texts or a foundational manifesto for western feminism and we will look into why later soon and the context for uh, the publish publication of this book is that uh, during that time one of the minister one of the ministers in the national assembly in france uh, published a report on the uh, education of women and he said that women should only be educated for the domestical purposes and they should be given only domestical intelligence and for this in response to this uh, wollstonecraft publishes vindication of the rights of women and she says that rights cannot be public uh, rights cannot cannot be based on tradition and it should only be based on reason and ra rationality and she argues for the education of women and by that all all classes of uh, children and yeah and this was exactly the time when most of the part uh, where there were uh, they were okay to allow women to be educated in certain sections but they still felt that political participation of women is uh, unessential or inessential and it is absurd so most uh, again most of the times vindication of rights of women was always considered as a educational tract or a treatise on uh, necessity for education rather than a political tract on the um, for a feminist um, theory of that times um it is uh, generally understood that she received lot of um, criticism for publishing this work but when the book was actually published there were it was being accepted and there was a reading public and which appreciated her effort efforts but later by the 19th and the 20th century she started uh, she started having lot of criticisms and critiques on the text as a um, not an in, uh, as an inadequate one um so the in, uh, some of the arguments are uh, all the arguments are de, um, segregated in different sections of the book and in the introduction of the book she pretty we will read an excerpt of the introduction and in the introduction she says that neglect of ed girls education is the reason the women or the adult women's conditions have not improved and they should not and they should not be treated as subordinate beings who only reason for existence is to be attractive and to provide emotional and sexual um entertainment for men and she also says that women buy into this oppression by being so attracted to the idea of beauty and spending lot of time in perfecting their beauty and therefore they must be uh, made aware of the fundamental rights and they should be they should be made aware of the possible opportunities to progress in the in one of the early chapters or the first chapter itself she says she mentions lot of reasons on why women are subjugated one she says is prejudice two again as we saw earlier it she sees it as lack of education and because of no education they have a they have a lack of ability to take on a profession and therefore uh, they all um stick to the idea of domesticated life and which means she says they all develop a sense of silliness and they develop a, because of no education and there is no um there is no knowledge as such that is being taught other than the domestic affairs they create they have lot of um, frivolous concerns such as jealous, jealousy over other women and therefore they also end up being immoral and uh, yeah so she says that women also have a soul just like the men do and if if the soul is unsexed 
then both sexes have a capacity for reason and should endeavor to exercise it. She says the men exercise the capacity to reason while the women don't and also because they don't have the awareness or they don't have the education to do so and there is no necessity for them to actually exercise it within the household or the domestic space. And for this reason of uh, unsexing the idea of mind, unsexing the idea of soul from the physical body, she receives a lot of criticisms from the future or the later feminists because for them the idea of the body should be accepted as it is and need, should not be the soul of the body or the being should not be removed from the body itself. And uh, um, in the second chapter, she gives or she details most of the way, like the various ways in which women are made subordinate and how they are taught that their paramount concern is to please the women, please the men and supposed to appear pretty. And this makes them re, uh, dependent on the men and therefore they do not have any necessity to exercise reason. And therefore common sense is ignored and emotion and sentiment are held closer to oneself. And uh, yeah, and when, when these kind of, uh, when this trend exists, when and when the girls, young girls become women and they do not have an education, they remain ignorant and as a result of this ignorance, they are not fit to bring up children, they are not fit to raise the family and they do not seem adequate to raise a responsible uh, another child. And uh, therefore, she says that men and women should be in a marriage should be like companions where both are able to support each other in um, both in emotionally and rationally and politically. In further chapters, uh, she talks about the women or the writers themselves who have perpetuated the idea of subordination of women and she mainly goes about criticizing Rousseau and where he says freedom is for the men and uh, when he says men, he does not include men as humans, but men as only men, excluding the women out of the picture. Although this was exactly the time when, and because Rousseau is considered as a figure who was uh, very influential in the French Revolution times, she holds him, um, she, ho she gives, she spends a bit of her sections of the book talking about what was actually wrong or what is so objectable about his works. And, um, in one of the chapters, she talks about the importance of development of character itself for the women and how uh, they should be taught nuances of knowledge that are very much necessary to, for them to be independent and to be and, it, they, and so that they are independent to not look for men who are decent in the sense of politically wealthy or in um, wealthy in the economic sense. And later in the uh, one of another chapter she spends on uh, talking about the subject of mod modesty and she explains that modesty is not the same as humility and the women who exercise modesty for the most reason, uh, sorry, she says that the women who exercise the most reason are the most modest in the sense that she is trying to push for rationality in women's lives and asking them all to be educated just so they can be rational and they can reason out on the future steps in one's own life. Hmm. Yeah, so she says that women's modesty can only improve when their bodies are strengthened and their minds are enlarged by active exertions. Here when she means by bodies are strengthened, she also remembers that men and women are unequal in the bodily or the uh, unequal in the physical strength and she says that then and she also says that because men have already been exposed to the idea of enlightenment exposed the idea of intelligence it is now time for the women to also follow their follow the uh, follow the same uh, trend and start being more active and use their minds Although in that uh, period, women's morality is generally undermined, she says that the reputation 
is what is most significantly upheld in the in the period and the men place the burden of reputation burden of upholding chastity on a woman's shoulder and this is not uh, this alone is not okay because men should also learn to be chaste and therefore it is upon the women when they are to upbring a child who will also be a responsible and more reputed personality who is also moral for both men and women she again goes on to say that women need more financial independence and that and that and the financial independence is not just for oneself but it's also a duty and a activity in the public sphere and if the women want to step into the public sphere from the domestic sphere they should be able to and that the education will be able to provide and uh, to be a good citizen to be a good citizen and to be a good mother, a mother the women have to pursue intelligence she also says that when women are uh, reformed through education they will stop being jealous of other women and they will also be good mother a good mothers who who kindly raise a child who is also responsible instead of tyrannizing the children and uh, spoiling them or spoiling them uh, some of the educational reforms that wolson craft thinks of or the ideas of reforms that she thinks of is to include a uh conflation of public and private education and she also uh, says suggests coeducation where men and women get uh, get to study in the same um space and she also calls for a more democratic and participatory education structure where there is little bit of flexibility to learn what the children want to learn especially for the social classes where she says the the lower classes who might want to go into a, a profession of their own would like to would should be allowed to ta- take that path when they reach a certain age and they should all not always be pushed towards learning philosophical and spiritual or religious um intelligence alone she details uh, in the one of the last chapters she also talks about um how women indulge in silliness like um fortune tellers and healers and she says they all end up reading stupid novels when she says stupid novels she means the novels that are about women which are about their relationships and friendships they share share with each other or uh, that that revolves around a life of love where they expect a knighthood or a, a expect a knight to sweep them off their feet and they she says they should stop caring about their dress and they need a big revolution in the um, manners and when she and then later she also gets criticized for the same and we will uh, see try to t- discuss that in the later section and she one of the concluding arguments she makes is that women's general women generally when the marriage is not successful and w- there is a fault of a woman or both men and the women the woman's fault is not a result of natural deficiency in the woman but it is stemmed from the socially constructed and socially shaped idea of life for and the insufficient education that the society provides for the girl or the woman so some of the themes that uh, that wolston craft deals with is marriage as a friendship where she says that both man and woman has to be a companion she says that only then both of them can um compensate for each other's faults and they can be mature in the dealing of their marriage life and raise responsible and moral children she again as we saw earlier she talks about uh, she criticizes sensibilities and she criticizes the idea of sentimentality instead she propagates reason and rationality to an extent that she says that um reason and rationality are to an extent masculine and that has to be imbibed or that has to be incurred by the women themselves to be able to step out of into the public sphere and she calls for edu- and most of her ta- tract is based on idea of educational reform and therefore as we saw it is generally considered as educational tract which is apolitical and she falls back on the idea of liberalism quite often in her statements and her arguments and uh, 
she is more about enriching the middle class women's lives than the upper class women she criticizes the upper class women's life for um being so ignorant and she says that the lower class women do not have the time to think of educating themselves and they are very already busy running um running around earning for their own families uh, most of the critics of wollstonecraft call out for her style of writing which they consider very misogynist and she is critiqued a lot for the distance as an author she creates between her and the women category that she talks about we will now read an excerpt from the introduction and then we will go about the other sections she she this is her talking um giving the introduction introduction my own sex i hope will excuse me if i treat them like rational creatures instead of flattering their fascinating graces and viewing them as if they were in a state of perpetual childhood unable to stand alone i earnestly wish to point out in what true dignity and human happiness i earnestly wish to point out what is true dignity and human happiness consists i wish to persuade women to endeavor to acquire strength both of mind and body and to convince them that the soft phrases susceptibility of heart delicacy of sentiment and refinement of taste are almost synonymous with epithet of weakness and that those of beings who are only the objects of pity and that kind of love which has been termed its sister will soon become objects of contempt we will later see i mean in reading through the book we'll also see that she uses the last line to talk about why the marriage fails or why the uh, marriage the failure of marriage is always on the burden is always a burden of women going back to the introduction dismissing then those pretty feminine phrases which the men condescendingly used to soften our lavish dependence uh, sorry dismissing then those pretty feminine phrases which the men condescendingly used to soften our slavish dependence and despising that weak elegancy of mind exquisite sensibility and sweet docility of manners supposed to be the sexual characteristics of weaker vessel i wish to show the ele- show that elegance is inferior to virtue that the first object of laudable ambition is to obtain a character as a human being regardless of the distinction of sex and that the secondary view should be brought to this simple touchstone this rough sketch of my plan and should i express my conviction with the energetic emotions that i feel whenever i think of the subject the dictates of experience and reflection dictates of experience and reflection will be felt by some of my readers animated animated by this important object i shall disdain to cull my phrases or polish my style i aim at being useful and sincere and sincerity will render me unaffected for wishing rather than persuade by the force of my arguments than diesel my diesel by the elegance of my language i shall not waste my time in rounding periods nor in fabricating the turgid bombast nor in fabricating the turgid bombast of artificial feelings which coming from the head never reach the heart i shall be employed about things not words and anxious to render my sex more respectable members of society i shall try to avoid that flowery diction which has slide which is which slides from essays into novels and from novels into familiar letters and conversations these pretty these pretty nothings these caricatures of real beauty of sensibility dropping glibly from the tongue vitiate the taste and create a kind of sickly delicacy that turns away from simple unadorned truth and a deluge of false sentiments and overstretched feelings stifling the natural emotions of the heart render the domestic pleasures insipid that ought to sweeten the exercise of those severe duties which educate a rational and immortal being for a nobler field of action here the nobler field of action means the uh, being involved or experiencing the public sphere the education of women has of late been more attended to than formerly yet they are still reckoned a frivolous sex ridiculed or pitied by the writers who endeavor by satire or instruction to improve them 
it is acknowledged that they spend many of the first years of their lives in acquiring a smattering of accomplishments. Meanwhile, strength of body and mind are sacrificed to libertine notions of beauty, to the desire of establishing themselves, the only way women can rise in the world by marriage. And this desire, making mere animals of them, when they marry, they act as such, uh, act as such children may be expected to act. They dress, they paint and nickname God's creatures. Surely these weak, weak beings are only fit for the seraglio. Can they govern a family or take care of the poor babies who they bring into the world? If then it can be fairly deduced from the present conduct of the sex, from the prevalent fondness for pleasure which takes place of ambition, which takes the place of ambition and those nobler passions that open and enlarge the soul, that the instruction which the women have received has only tended with the constitution of civil society to render them insig insignificant objects of desire, mere prop propagators of fools. If it, can be if it can be proved that in aiming to accomplish them without cultivating their understanding, they are taken out of their sphere of duties and made ridiculous and useless when the, sort the short-lived bloom of beauty is over. I presume that the rational men will excuse me for endeavouring to persuade them to become more masculine and respectable. I am sorry. I presume that the rational men will excuse me for endeavouring to persuade them to become more masculine and respectable. Indeed, the word masculine is only a bugbear. There is a little reason to fear that women will acquire too much courage for fortitude, for their apparent inferiority with respect to bodily strength must, must render them in some degree dependent on men in various relations of life. But why should it be increased by prejudices that give a sex to virtue and confound simple truths by sensual reveries? Women are in fact so much degraded by mistaken notions of female excellence that I do not mean to add a paradox when I assert that this artificial weakness produces a propensity to tyrannize and gives birth to cunning the natural the unnatural opponent of strength, which leads them to play off those contemptible infertile airs that undermine esteem while they excite desire. It seems scarcely necessary to say that I now speak of the sex in general. Many individuals have more sense than their male relatives, and as nothing propenderates, propenderates where the and as nothing propenderates where there is a constant struggle for an equilibrium, equilibrium without it has naturally more gravity. Some women govern their husbands without degrading themselves because intellect will always govern. So, this is an excerpt from the introduction where she pretty much, she provides most of the arguments she is going to elaborate later in her chapters. Um, as a part, as a course, as part of a course you are doing right now, which is lit literary criticism more on the lines, we will look into the stylistics, the rhetorics or the ideas that she creates as the text itself than going into the feminist argument she makes. Um, most of her arguments are contested again and again due to the uh, historically removed understanding or a retrospective understanding of the text. Um, that when kept in a historically located period, when kept, when understood in a um, more the at the conjunction of the personal life of the author and a political tract, you will see that that the arguments she provided were valid. Um, some of uh, when she argues for the revolution in female manners, she in the fem her feminist views are discussed through instructional literature, which are also fictional, such as Maria or Mary. And we will also see some of those um, instructional attitude flows into the um, non-fictional tract or the political tract itself. Although till now it has not been agreed upon as a political tract. Um, one of the argument that are inferred from her text is that she not just asks for the right of women and she also says that by propagating the rights of women and of men, uh, she respects the right of children. So, this way you see that there is a um, um, extension from a narrow idea of women and her oppression to a 
more subjugated uh, inclusion of more subjugated people or sideline people so let's look at the idea of masculine women before we go into the other sections um, the term transfers the patriarchal virtues attributed to the man to a woman and this woman is born from politics and at the same time rooted in the figure of the voice itself here the voice is that of mary wollstonecraft who has gone through a lot in her life where she has been a mother she has been a lover she has been a daughter and she has been a just a woman and this all of these experiences shaped the voice of the treatise and we will look more into this as we go forward she claims that her voice is the language of truth she disguises her voice in a rational in rational arguments and rhetoric to disrupt the discourse that is majorly masculine and she uses the available masculine discursive means to criticize the patriarchal society itself so she is criticizing the she is critiquing the society being part of the society and knowing that her ideas are somehow shaped by her experiences of the society and according to her there were no neutral or ungendered writings available in the 18th century at all and therefore in her endeavor to provide to critique the patriarchal society she ended up using the style that would distance her from the woman she was speaking for and their transformations into a rational woman so the whole idea of the book is to transform any woman into a rational being or a rational woman or a rational citizen who is eligible to be part of a political sphere and she for to do this she employs the uh, discourse discourse of um, intelligent intelligentsia that is ma majorly masculine um wolstonecraft close uh, wolstonecraft's works closely resemble the literary conventions that are employed by the male writers of the political theories which are uh, for example thomas paine uh, of those times or any other uh, political tract for that time she is very much related to the tradition of republicans and she is very much seen as a um follower in the tradition of john locke and his um and his treatises on rights and duties while the employ uh, she employs the first person speaker like we saw in the um uh, introduction and by doing that she found within the political discourse of the period that she um, sorry she employs a first person speaker pr uh, pronoun in the introduction but she also does it in a way that she is the observer of the whole society and therefore she distances herself from the women she is talking about so she does not use pronouns such as my sex or she does not pronounce as my sisters nothing of that sort but rarely she would have used anything uh, anything that shows that she is part of the women she is talking about and um, for, um she also asserts as we saw in this uh, starting that her treatise will address the head than the heart and to reflect this she again rarely uses the first person to offer any personal or emotional response rather it is always used to stress or define a certainty within the text and or an imperative gesture within the text for example she uses the um, phrase i shall even in the introductions by you by using a detached first person speaker the voice of the text pursues to convince the readers by demonstrating that it is a reasonable that uh, it um, it is reasonable it is a reasonable argument and uh, yeah there are these times where she has her emotional outbursts and we will talk about that later wolstonecraft continually um in one of the reviewer of the wig monthly uh, review reviews her work and says that wolstonecraft continually returns to gendered language as a necessary means to support her argument speaking through such images her voice assumes a masculine and therefore more accepted identity and her readers are more readily persuaded by its rationale this she uses as a strategy and this is this strategy is what determines the presence of a masculine woman in woman in her uh, work 
So, she, the gendered language is the political language itself she is using and uh, by assuming or by going with the idea that rationality and reason are masculine while sentimentality is feminine, she tries to subvert the whole idea of understanding of masculinity and femininity and the patriarchal hegemony in, even in the language. One of, her, one of the critiques, John Whale, contests that Wollstonecraft is engaged in an act of ventriloquism and argues that she is merely adopting the macho language of the enlightened rationalist and suppressing her feelings. This accusation forces, closely, uh, forces us to closely in, inspect the work and this change in voice that he is talking about is found in some of the exclamations. So, there is a paragraph where um, she mentions what Rousseau talks about the idea of woman or her um, her condition as a woman and then she exclaims what nonsense and these are the moments in the text where the woman behind the voice, the woman behind the words that is giving a political treatise is peek, uh, peeking out. So, these are the moments where we see that she is trying to balance the idea of herself as a woman who is experiencing these uh, social conditions and at the same time who is trying to urge the people in a rational manner to let go of those conditioning and constructions. In some of the places, Wollstonecraft reveals a voice that is both passionate and enthusiastic, so contradicting to the voice that is meant to appear calm, deliberate, uh, calm and deliberated and therefore judicious. In another instance, the readers discover energetic outbursts and lyrical intrusions. For example, when describing a case of a woman, she says this, will a woman who will soon find that her charms are oblique sunbeams when the summer is past and gone. So, this she talks about when she is talking about the uh, woman who is more, um, who are more fixed to the idea of beauty itself. She hides her charged emotions behind the wall of rhetoric and there is a struggle to fit her reality as a thinking and a feeling woman against the portrayal of the masculine woman that she tends to create or exhibit. And there are these small disruptions such as the emotional outburst itself uh, in the text which confirms the difficulty of presenting the masculine woman in the text, um, restricted by the patriarchal society in which she is part of and against which, against which she is re rebelling. Wollstonecraft cannot define a masculine woman that satisfies both her theory, her experience and of being a woman and thus she asks where are they to be found. Here we see uh, this, um, the, uh, the idea of masculine women uh, is more analyzed by this uh, person called Imogene uh, Cambridge in 2017, uh, published in the uh, article published in 2017 and she talks about, she explains more on the idea of her voice that is trying to place masculine women within her experiences as women. So, she creates this tension where there is a masculine woman who is supposed to be able to or who is capable of participating in the political sphere and there is a woman who is still ignorant of the idea of political sphere and who is experiencing uh, just the domestic uh, life, uh, life I might say so. And uh, to, to do this to present the masculine woman or she to push for the idea of a masculine woman where she means masculine here as the rational and the more reasoning woman uh, who need not be very detached from sensibilities or detached from emotional and sens uh, sentimentality, but somebody who is able to um, logically go forward and make choices in life or logically live the life as a companion to man who is not subjugated as part of the society. Well, let us go into the Wollstonecraft stylistic choices that she makes to go about the political treatise. We are doing, we are looking at the text itself and the structure of the text and the way it is written more because it is the course on lit criticism and when while her arguments do matter and they are very contested, we are quite uh, and her work is very relevant to the period, we have come far away to understand the um, depth of her arguments for the period. The style 
any the style of the text is a majorly discussed topic in a rhetorical theory in rhetorical theory and debates on style has resulted in reversing of ideas even in the past and style determines the political potential of the text and the ideological um, boundaries of any text in wollstonecraft uh, wollstonecraft critiques the institutions and the social systems in her in the vindication of rights of women and she generally operates in the realm of abstract where she is discussing concepts and uh, she is con discussing the concept of subversion she is di not subversion she is discussing the concept of um, being oppressed she is discussing the concept of intelligence and the idea of political participation but these in doing these discussions there is a value of virtue that she discusses as a fundamental idea and this she says is abstract for both life of uh, for any life a may be uh, male or female and therefore she removes the idea of virtue to uh, from the person as a body and places it on the person as an identity person as a being and by doing this she receives a lot of criticism for um, degendering the idea of soul and the idea of mind for which you um, which to understand this you might we might have to really understand the historical significance significance of this text or the historical context of this text for which we do uh, which is beyond the scope of this presentation one of the rhetorical devices um, wollstonecraft uses is the rhetorical questions itself she asks a question a question that is asked for which the answer is not accepted this is made to express opinions that will be agreeable by the re for the readers too and there will be a support of the readers because the question is such that answers cannot be exp expected while at the same time the questions are so direct and so um, grounded she critiques the institution of marriage and at the same time she, the inequality that is present between a married couple through the question can they be expected to govern a family with judgment or take care of the poor babies when they bring in whom they bring into the world this question condemns the idealized um, notion of beauty or the realm of beauty for a woman itself um, especially among the unmarried women which after a point the idea of beauty is irrelevant to their lives and because they were so um, grounded in perfecting their own beauty they did not they become unfit to take care of the family another rhetorical device she uses is the uh, an, uh, lot of analogies analogies and ana analogies and uh, wollstonecraft for example for an instance wollstonecraft claims that no proper education in the girls resulted in in their health, unhealthy minds and she says the conduct and manners of women in fact evidently prove that their minds are not in a healthy state for like the flowers which are planted in too rich a soil strength and usefulness are sacrificed to beauty and the flaunting leaves after having pleased the fastidious eyes fade disregarded on the stalk long before the season why they uh, long before the season they ought to have arrived at maturity this talks about how uh, the woman becomes unfit after a point when she has children and she does not know how to grow them up these rhetorical devices the questions and the analogies or the metaphors she does not really use a metaphors but it's more like the similes she tries to explain a concept comparing it with another concept uh, like the flower we just saw and um, these devices allow the author to argue for the both theoretical concepts and at the same time the domestic grounded experiences of the women there are two different notions of reading the rhetorical style um, one is anachronism and the other one is called the Uh, aesthetic monism um one of the uh, so for example uh, um when you read a text from the retrospective lens it is called and uh, situate the text outside the historical specificity it is called more it is an example of anachronism and um, the um the frequent question that is asked is the fairness of the uh retrospective uh, or the retro uh perspective projection of the text or the stress on the text um 
especially that is of the uh, 18th or the 17th century most of the times. And uh, new literary theories diverge the readings from the diverge the readings from the historically recognized understandings and it is on this basis generally feminist critiques offer a radically different readings of literary texts that have been commented upon um, earlier for or that have been already celebrated. Their readings are based in um, part, their, their readings are mostly based on the premise that women have con consistently have been slandered and objectified in literature and have also been largely excluded from literary uh, production and criticism. Um, and therefore, any text written in any period or in any history must be read, uh, must be criticized for the way they um, create the image of the women. And taking an example of um, Siksu, she urges that women should have their own of, find their own of uh, own way. Siksu urges women to find their own way of writing that is free from binaries and at the same time, um, um, she also says that the, they should object the prejudices that the women or that the male dominated literary arena itself had established in the earlier traditions. This she talks, this is a work, this is from the work she published in 1976. So, um, that is exactly why she talks about male dominated literary establishment that when, when reading this text is more um, relevant because when uh, Wollstonecraft published this book, uh, published this tract, it was um, most, she had very few predecessors. So, Sikso argues or demands that women write, women must write women. So, and any argument about the applicability of modern notion of style should turn on the validity of the underlying, turn to the validity of the underlying premises of the text or the, um, uh, of the, uh, of the text and uh, the foundational premise in here uh, is viewed uh, through the um, writer's techniques or the, um, the style of writing itself and how the style affects the message through their rhetorical techniques or through other um, structure of the text itself sometimes. And uh, the style and meaning are close, sometimes are way too closely related and uh, therefore, they cannot be separated and that is exactly why sometimes the style of the writing is uh, un inseparable from the meaning itself. And for example, in this text, we see that, we will see later how the, oh we saw all earlier that um, Wollstonecraft hides her experience as a woman behind the walls of uh, masculine rhetorical techniques of uh, first member, uh, first person speaker who is speaking detached, whose voice is detached from the experienced woman, whose she is also part of or the category which she is also part of. Another um, method of uh, looking at the rhetorical style is aesthetic monism and uh, the, most of the times uh, both anachronism and aesthetic monism are seen in a, in two different, are seen in the two different sides of a spectrum or they are seen oppos opposingly or oppositely contrastingly and um, uh, aesthetic monism is of the view that any writer should blindly adopt any organ, um, blindly adopt any organic theories of writing that exist and uh, they should write whatever they feel and that the way they express their feelings are inherently meaningful and anything they say are supposed to be inherently meaningful. However, when you see a literary text within the classical traditions, uh, it allows the reader to use any a theory that would help the reader to understand the effect of author's subconscious on his or her art or text. At the same time, it assumes that uh, author's choice of style was deliberate and therefore, it does not give space, it does not give a space for doubt or ambiguity. And this is, um, the aesthetic monism is mostly related to the, uh, to Louis T. Millick and this 
the uh, explanation of aesthetic mon uh, monism that I have taken is also from Millick's work, which was published in 1965. Um, in the analysis of uh, Wollstonecraft's work, we see that she shifts from discussion about education for women to larger debates about the nature of women uh, that is prevalent in England, especially or more broadly in Europe, intellectual communities. Um, she looks at the works produced or contrib the contributions of uh, Bacon, uh, France uh, looks morely into the works of Milton and Rousseau and uh, the, de the history she deals with is very recent history if you actually see and, uh, theref and therefore the understanding of uh, the women or the western thought of women's nature and role in society is also from the uh, from that era. She argues um, against the arguments of on acquirement of virtue which is very inherently masculine and she wants to oppose in her through her argue she wants to oppose the arguments provided which arguments provided to bar any woman from education and for her enlightenment, enlightenment influence meaning of the lexical term virtue and that is something anything or the something related to agency or self actuation and this idea of virtue she says is constructed for just the masculine community or the mas male members of the society and for the female to be able to accommodate the idea of virtue, they must start being educated and they must start adopting uh, reasons or uh, the skills of reasoning. She argues if the women are not swarm of eph uh, if the women are not a swarm of ephemeral trifflers, why should they be kept in ignorance under the specious name of innocence? So, she does not approve of the idea of um, innocence itself um, that are being attributed to the women and therefore keeping them away. One of the, um, one of the um, writers slash critiques wrote a book called Fighting Slice, uh, sorry. Luke Reddington, who is one of, uh, who is the author of the book Fighting Styles, published his published in 2013, argues that in her challenge of subservient representation of Eve and Milton's Paradise Lost, her learned and the polemic style allows her to be an enlightened individual, and that makes her masculine in that sense. Uh, Reddington says that her style demands an answer, and it pre it presents a challenge, which also at the same time displays her acumen. He goes on to say that Wollstonecraft, uh, Wollstonecraft's tone is the sy stylistic equivalent of the call to storm the Bastille in um, France. This is the one that, this is right before the France Revolution, the storming of the Bastille happened and that is supposed to be vi very violent, very, um, very forceful and very on the face and that is exactly what he says her work was to the time. In response, uh, he also, uh, he um, like building on the arguments of Reddington, Rousseau in one of his works says that with respect to the female character, obedience is the grand lesson which ought to be impressed with um, unrelenting rigour for which she gives us a response, what nonsense, when will a great man arise with sufficient strength of mind to puff away the fumes which pride and sensuality have thus spread over the subject. That Reddington says has an attack or um, attack on man or in um, or provides the label ad hominem. Reddington notes that she attacks Rousseau and the propagators of rights of men as only for men for their faulty logic based on which they form that argument itself and she continues that in the insistence that virtue is a human nature, it must include all humans and not just men. He also says that Wollstonecraft uses the style to distance herself from women in general and to by this, she also aligns herself more closely with the men for whom with whom she seeks an audience. She saw style as a cent she saw style as central to gender and she chose to adopt a socially solitary role for the sake of a rhetorical mission. She is thought that by making her text or it is believed that she took her, she wrote it in a style that would make her work more rational and more 
political just so that she could have the men's audience which in a different sense it is not an instructional manual just for the women or it is not instructional nature just for the women but this is critique and an instructional manual of the patriarchal society for the members who are propagating patriarchy which in the most cases men although she says that it is inherently embedded within the women to allow themselves to be oppressed and that must that could only change with co co, uh, co education and uh, similar education for both male and women and responsible parent parenting from the side of mostly especially from the side of women um yeah so through her stylistic techniques she illustrates the hegemony in her work uh, the hegemony within the society which is again getting reflected in her work at the same time she's trying to subvert that hegemony through her work uh, drawing a parallel to sisuk's um, undertaking undertaking on what kind of writing women writers should take we see that her adoption uh, we see that wollstone crafts adoption of these techniques were justified as the right tools to accomplish the task at hand sisuk's uh, claim that women should uh, consider themselves free to take any style from the works of male dominant world of writing and then use it in their own way which the uh, reddington believes is what um wolfson craft craft have has done and in the starting of uh, we do see a lot of um, so one of the examples we uh, so here by quoting sisuk we have been able to pos- sorry quoting sisuk we have been able to possess anything only by flying in french to fly has the double meaning to steal we have lived in flight stealing away finding when desired narrow passages passageways hidden crossovers um this pretty much gives what sisuk is trying to tell for the women writers and this we also see is very common in wolfson craft's writing and uh, another critique analyzes wolfson craft's writing or the rhetoric used by wolfson craft uh, as she participates in the masculine discourse um so she uses a very persuasive prose intended for the public arena wolfson craft and to do this she uses three techniques she uh, wolfson craft adopts and draws attention to her forthright style for example we saw in the introduction she is trying to say how she is trying to do that she just does not say she does not just use the first person um speaker distance from the ma- uh, women but she also shows that she is distancing herself very clearly in the introduction and she also says that um don't don't take me wrong but this is what exists um wolfson craft condemns the affected femininity just like her very few predecessors of that same time and this way she is using the already existing rhetoric in the uh, literary tradition and another technique she uses is that she described a healthy effective unaffected woman who matches men in their ability to exercise masculine tra- uh, she described a healthy effective and unaffected woman who matches men in their ability to exercise the masculine traits of language within this category of within this category or new category she created uh, she placed herself and she called this category genus or or in a sim- on in a simpler term the exceptional woman sure she wanted everybody to be part of that category but she says still it has uh, during her time she says that she is part of the category and she wishes that everybody becomes a part of this category so that not because the country would move forward not because that men are not because she wants to subvert the patriarchal society alone but also because she does not want the adult woman category itself to stagnate and she wants progress for them or their um, their living experiences so um going back to the criticisms that the uh, work received from the feminist literary theory mostly most generally is that uh, the idea of universality within the uh, text so she writes in the introduction of the text she says she is a spokesperson for all the women and that her ability to write fancily in arguing for substantiate ideas will influence the reputation of the women at collective so it might in the sense that it might either result in a rise of the reputation or because of the um tech uh, style she um took up it will reduce their reputation as women itself 
which we see that her um, later in the times when due to her uh, life history, her work started to have less and less relevance to the society. Um, um, yeah, so one uh, broad, two of the editors of the Broadview Press try to formulate another uh, when they were formulating another edition of Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Women. Uh, the editors are uh, D. L. Macdonald and Kathleen Schroff. They debate and discuss the charges which are generally against the work, and in the political in the political idea of the work itself. The major challenge or the major uh, charge against the work is that um, it is it is using a lot of universalist claims, and at the same time they argue that most of the modern movements would have foregrounded in some revolutionaries universalist claims. Yet the universalism that Wollstonecraft exhibits is has its own limits. The one she claims to, the one she grounds herself in, has its limits. For example. When she is talking about the education of the all men, both children um, and women in a similar or in a um, equal setting, she also asks, uh, she also talks about the classing, the social classes which are prevalent and uh, she never talks about the um, inherent inequality within the social classes either when she is talking. So, she says that they might want to take up vocational training for the profession, they might want to continue as the class as part of a low class they might be and they should be allowed to do that. And for the women, she all she says that they need to be educated, they need to become like men, but not only because they want to be part of the political sphere or become uh, be part of the conversations in the political sphere, but most mainly because they have to be able to raise a better children, they have to be able to produce more better citizens. And this could also be, this could be seen in two lights, one that she genuinely believes that that is the reason or the, the second reason could be that that is the first step into the bigger progress that she wants to have, like she, she wants to uh, or the two that she looks at this as the first step towards uh, betterment of uh, women's lives. So, going back to the uh, com um, comments on um, sh uh, comments by Macdonald and Scherf, they say that her text places can be placed in the republican traditions and because she sees or recognizes both the reason and the passion, at the same time she argues for both rights and utility. And in the case of utility, she, when she is talking about the middle class women, she, uh, she generally argues because they, she wants them to be independent economically and financially, uh, not economic, uh, she wants them to be independent financially and her works, uh, so although she is grounded, her works present an ambivalence in the ideas that are very prevalent for any political thinker and the fact that they say this also means that she was never considered as anybody as a phil political philosopher or political thinker. So, they say, the project of thinking about universalist claims and thus about the concept of rights, however, plunges us into a dialogue or an aporia between situational difference and the language of the universal right. The unresolvable uh, internal disjunction or the tension inherent uh, is seen in, the inher uh, in her work, received a lot of confrontations, um, this in uh, sorry, this unresolvable operatic and uh, tension within which is inherent in her work received lot of feminist um, confrontations itself. And this is what we I was trying to explain some time back when I was saying that she was trying to um, balance the idea of women being educated for themselves and at the same time educating themselves as part of providing better citizens. So, in another sense, she also uses um, religious ideas as grounds for an argument and um, especially in the concerns of rights and justice and to attest. Um, so, by this, the, the recognition she receives is that of a hagiographic approach and, uh, uh, and this means that she just does not provide views as a 
author or just the woman, but she also makes the work relevant by this approach she holds like by providing more ambiguities and providing more tensions within her work and these tensions will allow future interpretative um, possibilities for what the work might have meant and um, especially by situating it to a historical era uh, and social era. So, this this internal disjunction that the, uh, that the editors are trying to talk about when she is making the ideas of rights. She also talks about how the ideas of faith or the ideas of justice is very related to Christian idea of justice, which is that also to that of the Protestant, Protestant England ideas and uh, therefore, that makes her less universal in um, understanding, which although might although could be considered as making her irrelevant for the current times, it the work itself by providing this ambiguity in her sorry by providing this tension between placing a universal the ideas of universal right and with the ideas of grounding what she means by equality, she creates a internal um, um, tension which provides for further discussions which as the time moves forward will can be used to uh, progress the whole category of women itself. And the, these tensions are not unique to her works, they are very much situated in the literary period of the production in the 18th century and uh, the recognition and the exploration of these tensions in the work will lead to hermeneutic or interpretative potentials otherwise lost to a less critical or less historically oriented reading. By creating this tension within the text, the passages become more loaded in some of uh, sometimes and pro providing for a very heavy connotative meaning when read in less crisp when when read in a less through a less critical lens it becomes more universalized and uh, when universalized the the whole tension is ignored and that the ignoring of the tension makes the text more um, irrelevant Um, Graham Allen is one of the uh, critiques of Vindication of Rights of Women or a reviewer who says that Vindication of Rights of Women is a fascinating example for as a political or philosophical or at the same time ethical modernism. He says, um, founded on the necessity to go back to the first principles in search of the most simple truths and to dispute with some prevailing prejudices every inch of the ground, the text rests on the projection of aims rather than tracing of origins, on a logic of becoming rather than a secure authoritative position of such first principles. Although when, when, a, when the feminist criticisms are mostly based on the fact that it sometimes it is being claimed as a foundational text for the reason but, uh, some of the critiques also come forward and say that it is not a very bound text, it allows for more interpretative um, possibilities, it allows for it allows you to see how mod, um, how uh, it uses modernist techniques of um, she generally uses modernist techniques and here they pretty much mean the emotional outbursts that pop up and take a peek and uh, through which she allows the voice of her um, voice of her self as a woman uh, loud into the political tract which is very masculinely gendered. He argue uh, like um, he argues that Wollstonecraft's works attack theories of origination uh, such as Rousseau's work thinking the thinking the inhuman as coined by Loitard is a thinking that is a thinking of the possibility of the thought outside of the system which constructs the thinker and uh, thus the thinking that is squarely placed within the system which is which we see is the case with Wollstonecraft's work um, is a momentary discovery which threatens to rupture the systematic thinking or an ideological thinking it is actually supposed to support. She, this is an act of subversion and by critiquing the patriarchal hegemony 
through a pet a masculine masculine discourse she subverts she propagates the ideas of letting go of those uh, social conditions and by that she is subverting the whole idea of masculinity idea of gendering and the idea of social constructions not the idea of sorry uh, masculinity and the patriarchal hegemony in the through social construction of how to how should a woman be allen also continues or uh, that wolston craft's work thought beyond the inequalities and prejudices of the system within which it was generated and yet in struggling to think this beyond wolston craft based her notions of transcendence on the very terms and foundations of the ideology she was attempting to escape wolston craft's text breaks through into and manages to speak of a beyond it cannot ground or authorize these moments are stylized in terms of temperamental romanticism standing in front of tension to a committed uh, to a committed rationalism this is exactly this is what this exactly means the tension between the um, rational voice and the emotional outburst and therefore while reviewing the and by doing this he reviews her reviews the work wolston craft's work a uh, vindication of rights of women as such the relevant wolston craft the figure who is something more than the dead mother of a supposedly incremental tradition of feminist thought is an author who was paradoxically entombed within and yet liberated by the confines of her revolutionary period of history a moved and yet because of that a situated spectator this recogn- this recognizes wolston craft as the rebellious daughter of her times and a perspective which is as important as the more commonly known figuration of her as a mother of feminism so by so he says that by looking at her as a mother of feminism there is a um, necessity to bound the text necessity to make it very concrete necessity to make it inclusionary for every uh, included making it very uh, inclusive of every um, possible notions of an ideas of women's experience however he says instead she is a she is or instead she could be looked at a rebellious daughter of her times by which he means that even with the constraints of her period of history she used the discourse a discourse of a uh, discourse that is associated with masculinity to talk about the tradition that has been progressing since then a feminist thought i would like to conclude the presentation with a suggestion for further reading um a chapter titled the problem of cultural bias wolston craft mill and western narratives of women's progress from the book wolston craft mill and women's human rights by eileen hunt botting this work allows um this work gen- uh, allows you to understand the um culturally um sorry the this work allows you to understand the idea of universality and the idea of w- the difference between the western women's progress and its and the idea of human rights itself um thank you <laughs>